Hello everyone and welcome to the Essilor Luxottica first half 2022 results presentation. At the end of the presentation there will be a 30 minute Q&A session where you'll be allowed a minimum and maximum of two questions. If you'd like to ask a question you may do so by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. I now turn the call over to our host, Francesca Mieri, Chairman and CEO. Good morning all and thank you for joining us. Before commenting our first half result, let me spend some words to celebrate the memory of Leonardo del Vecchio. It's already a month since he left us and we all miss his patience, his dedication and commitment to innovate our company and the whole industry. I am honored to have the responsibility to continue the journey he started and to grow a Silor Luxottica inspired by its values, vision and strategy. Leonardo would have been particularly proud of the results we are presenting today, with the achievements of the second quarter and the first half of the year. In a deteriorated macro environment, our open and flexible business model as well as our diversified footprint, continued to drive the growth of our sales and margins. We are the only player in the industry with a leading presence in all the geographies and all the business segments, which help us to mitigate the market headwinds and to capitalize on its positive trends. In addition, our fast and effective decision-making process greatly helps us to adapt quicker and better to the evolving customer needs. This is the kind of result we target. As a network company focus on the evolution of the industry and the upgrade of the category, driven by a sustainable and inclusive business platform, for the benefit of the company and all its stakeholders. At this stage, is not comparable revenue grew in all the countries worldwide, excluding China and Russia. What we are especially proud of is our strong margin expansion in the context of rising inflation on energy, labor, transport and raw materials, we managed to deliver a 100 basis point lift in the adjusted operating profit margin, up to 18.4%. Free cash flow delivery was also solid and continued to support our investments in the innovation of product and services. We look forward to meeting you in September at our Capital Market Day in our brand new digital and design hub where you will have an immersive experience into the future of our company and industry. And with that, I will leave the floor to Paul and Stefan. Thank you, Francesco, and good morning, everyone. Happy to be with you today. Before I share with you a few highlights from our H1, I would like to echo Francesco's words and address a special thought for Chairman Leonardo Del Vecchio. His unique vision and values will continue to guide us as we carry on his inspiring legacy with our team. Looking at our results today, 
you see a strong and unified company, effective, impactful, and on a clear trajectory. This was made possible thanks to a few factors. First, the unique commitment and talent of our 180,000 people worldwide. We have created a unified, efficient, and focused organization with highly skilled and experienced leaders across the company who are putting in place their integrated organization while delivering on objectives. Together with Francesco, we thank our teams for the outstanding work done in H1 in a complex environment. Second, our unique innovation and solutions capability. Since the beginning of the year, we have seen our innovation truly at work. Reban and Oakley continued their healthy growth, notably with Reban Stories, Oakley Prism, which we will continue to roll out. On the land side, Varidux, Chrysal, Transition, and Eisen continue to perform extremely well while we continue to expand status. Third, our brand portfolio delivered great results, benefiting from our omni-channel approach and the performance of our luxury eyewear brand, as well as Reban and Oakley. Stefano will tell you more about it. It was quite impressive to see our collection during the Essilor Luxotica days held in our Tortona new showroom in Milan throughout July. We had the pleasure to welcome hundreds of customers from all regions in the world. Four, the progressive integration of Grand Vision. The past months have further highlighted their complementary skills and know-how which truly enriched the organization. Fifth, I would like to highlight the power of our supply chain from a manufacturing, logistic, and lab standpoint. This unique global network of plants, distribution center, and labs has once again proven its resilience and adaptability in a very complex environment and we continue to invest significantly to make this supply chain even stronger and support our growth. And last, but not least, mission and sustainability, where we celebrated some important milestones in H1. First, the launch of the one-site Essilor Luxotica Foundation, which unites all of the group's global advocacy and philanthropic actions to scale them up and accelerate them. The Foundation will play a key role in realizing the United Nations Resolution Vision for All. And second, the first anniversary of our sustainability program, Eyes on the Planet. Since its launch, we have been implementing projects to advance on each strategic pillar, carbon, circularity, world site, inclusion, and ethics. A key highlight in H1 was the completion of our first carbon footprint assessment globally, bringing a complete understanding of our direct and indirect CO2 impacts at each stage of the value chain. The collection of data not only improved our reporting capabilities, but also provided a clear overview of scope three emissions. While progressing towards our 2025 carbon neutrality target for direct operation, we want to widen our effort and prepare a more comprehensive and long-term roadmap covering scope one, two, three. As you can see, we have solid fundamentals in place, which makes us an effective and focused organization and supported our performance in H1. Looking ahead, we will keep this focus to deliver on H2 and prepare the ground for 2023 and the years to come. With that, I hand over to Stefano. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everybody. Uh, let's take now a closer look to our sales results, and, uh, and then afterwards, let's dig into our profit and loss uh, and our uh, financial position for the first half of 2022. Our top line in the second quarter grew on a 36% on a reported basis with Grand Vision part of our results in 2022. 
While if we consider on a comparable basis uh, with Grand Vision in both 2021 as well as 2022, our top line grew 14% at current effects and 7% at constant current. This result, if you think about it, is quite remarkable because it comes on top of an 8% growth that the group reported uh, in 2021 uh, second quarter versus the second quarter of pre-pandemic 2019. From a currency standpoint, as you can see, we're experiencing quite strong tailwinds in our results, with the US dollar that revaluated approximately 13% versus euro during the course of the second quarter. As you can imagine, if currencies remain at those levels, we can expect those tailwinds to continue all the way through the end of 2022. But now, let's take a closer look uh, into our two operating segments. We are pleased to report growth in both of them, strong growth, I would say, in both of them, with a professional solution that posted a top line up 5.5% at constant currency, on top of a 5% growth that we recorded in the second quarter 21 versus 2019. All the four regions posted solid growth, with Latin America leading the way at double-digit pace, while EMEA posted a mid-single digit and North America and Asia Pact that posted a low single digit growth during the course of the second quarter. The dollar to consumer segment posted the top line up 8.5% on top of 11% growth that we recorded in Q2 2021 versus 2019. And that proves once again the strength of our omni channel proposition with our e commerce business that was flat on top of 70% growth last year and our brick and mortar that grew approximately double digit with EMEA and Latin America very much driving those results with a double digit pace. But now as usual, let's start getting into our four different regions and let's begin with the biggest one, North America. North America posted a comparable revenue in the second quarter 2.4% on top of a 16% growth last year versus 2019. Beginning with our professional solution, both frames and lenses posted solid growth during the course of the second quarter. I would say pretty remarkable, in particular on the frame side of the business, where in Q221 we recorded a growth of approximately 20% versus 2019. We believe that the market and the demand in the market is still there. From a channel mix standpoint, our key account, our department source, very much were leading the growth during the course of the second quarter, while independent ECP channel experienced a deceleration during the course of the second quarter, and we see the price mix on the positive side continues to be solid for both lenses as well as for frames. If we now look at our direct-to-consumer segment, we are now positive in the second quarter despite a very tough comparison base. In Q2 last year, we grew 22% versus 2019. Sunglass accounts were flat, on top of a 14% comps last year, and Lens Factor posted accounts that were slightly negative, on top of 11% comp sales that we recorded last year versus 2019. The last touch on our Oakley Retail banner that posted a double digit growth uh, during the course of the second quarter, proving once again the strength of the Oakley brand, in particular in North America. But now let's go to our, uh, our second largest region, EMEA, that posted a remarkable 12.4% growth uh, in the second quarter on a comparable basis. Both divisions reported solid results in Q2, with professional solution and mid-single digit growth, and our direct-to-consumer segment strong double digit. In our professional solution, we are pleased to report that Spain was double digit, the UK was double digit, the Turkey was double digit and uh, we were actually on the high single digit territory for Germany and Eastern Europe, while the only key country in Europe that was slightly negative during the course of the second quarter was France, and that was very much due to a deceleration on the optical frame business, while on the land side of our business in France, we are still holding up, driven by solid price mix, in particular branded lenses. If we now move for a second to our direct-to-consumer segment, our optical retail chain grew double digit during the course of a quarter, while some retail banners grew in excess of 80%, with several key locations in Europe that see now a strong rebound of touristic traffic inflows. 
If we look a little bit closely, our different optical banner, San Morega Vigano was double digits during the course of a second quarter. Grand Vision was actually double digits during the course of Q2, supported by growth in France, Spain, Nordic, as well as in Eastern Europe. So, a very compelling story for EMEA, and now let's have a look at East uh, into Asia PAC. Asia PAC reported a growth of 1.7% uh, on a comparable basis for the second quarter. This was another quarter at low single digit for this region, with professional solutions solid positive, and our direct to consumer segment that was slightly negative during the course of Q2. Clearly, when we talk about Asia PAC, you all understand that we, our results were uh, impacted in a way by the severe lockdown that were mandated in China during the course of a second quarter. With quite a few restrictions, they were easier just a few days before the end of the second quarter. If we would exclude mainland China from the results of Asia Pacific region, you would have seen a growth in the range of 20% during the course of the second quarter. On the professional solution side, I would highlight a strong delivery of India at triple digit pace, very much driven by volume growth in both lenses and frames, but also Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia, they all reported strong growth during the course of the second quarter. In China, our professional solution segments were back to positive in the month of June, supported by our growth in a lens branded portfolio, and in particular, thanks to Stellar. And as we speak now, very much at the end of July, we already sold more units with Stellar's lenses in China than in the entire 2021. And we're now very excited as we're getting into the high season of the back-to-school period because we believe that that volume growth is going to further accelerate. On a retail side, we posted double-digit growth in the sun business, very much driven by sunglass sets in Australia as well as in Southeast Asia. And on the optical side, we observed a decline in China, very much due to the lockdown that I described you before, but we were then pleased to see a rebound in our OPSM business. The overall was flat during the course of the second quarter with a double-digit pace in the month of June. And now let's move to the last region, that is Latin America. Latin America was, for the third consecutive quarter, the best performing region in Acero Luxottica. Both professional solution and direct to consumer were at double digit pace. In professional solution, both Brazil and Latin America, both frames and lenses, performed on a double digit pace. On the lens side, our growth was primarily driven by price mix, very much due to the branded lenses, with our key branded lenses, Varilux, at a double digit pace. Let's touch on our critical assets in the region, that is Ochi Carol that posted a quarter, second quarter, of double-digit growth rate. If we move for a second to our direct-to-consumer segment, both our optical retail banners and our SAM banners delivered a double-digit growth during the course of a second quarter. With GMO that was double-digit, with Grand Vision that was double-digit, with Sunglass Sat that did another double-digit growth in Andes, Mexico, as well as in Brazil. So, a very nice way to close the journey across the different region. And as I anticipated before, let's now take a closer look to our profit and loss. As we've always been talking about Astro Luxottica, we said that our storyline is a storyline of top-line growth and margin expansion. And what you can see in this page is very much a confirmation of that statement. I won't spend too much time on the, on the top line, as we already commented before, and I think what we should focus on is very much our profitability. As you can see, we were capable to expand margin with top line growth. Our operating profit on an adjusted basis for the first half of 2022 was 18.4%. That means 100 basis points improvement at current tax rate, and excluding currency, you would be looking at 80 basis points improvement on a constant effects basis. The key areas of improvement in our profit and loss was the gross margin, where you do see a 30 basis points improvement versus 2021 first out. Both professional solution and direct to consumer show margin expansion during the first half of the year. And the main driver of that margin expansion for the first half was very much our price mix. In addition, it's important to mention that our profit and loss uh, 
was capable to absorb the headwinds deriving from the inflationary impact around the world. And if you ask me how much do you estimate that, I would tell you that we were probably absorbing 100 to 150 basis points of headwinds deriving from inflation. If we look at below our operating profit on a net profit basis, you will be looking at a margin improvement of 110 basis points versus first half of 2021, with a margin rate at 12.9% on a net profit. If we exclude currency, you will be looking at 100 basis points improvement on a net profit. So overall margin expansion quite remarkable for the first six months of 2022. The last chapter of our finance section is very much dedicated to our free cash flow generation. For the first six months of 2022, Exelor Luxottica generated in excess of 900 million free cash flow. That free cash flow was achieved despite a quite material lift in capex investments. As a matter of fact, we invested 350 million more than what we did in 2021 were investment in supply chain, in strengthening and diversifying our manufacturing capacity, in renovating our store footprint, in converging progressively our IT uh, infrastructure into a single platform. All in all, we were capable to generate strong free cash flow and at the same time continue to invest in the company. Our overall net debt position is at 10.4 billion and our net debt to EBDA is below to at 1.8 for the first six months of the year. With that, uh, let me hand it over to the operator for the Q&A session. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad now. If you would like to remove your question, please press star followed by two. Please limit your questions to a maximum of two and ensure your phone is unmuted locally. Our first question today comes from Susie Tiboldi with UBS. Susie, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so my first question would be on the top line trends that you're seeing uh, both in uh, Europe and in the US, because you mentioned several times that the, um, let's say the conditions, the macro conditions are a little bit deteriorating, um, and especially at the lower end. Um, entry level point of the product portfolio, whereas it sounds like the higher end is still doing quite well. Um, so can you just give us a little bit more comments, uh, um, especially on these two very important regions, um, also in light of, um, of of the second half of the year, because I know you don't comment on the current trends usually, but um, you know uh, your midterm guide is for a mid single digit growth. Is this something that you feel comfortable with for H2, or do you think a low single digit growth would be more, more of a reasonable expectation? Um, then secondly, uh, a question on the margins. Um, you, you delivered a really excellent margin expansion despite the inflationary pressures. Um, and I know you don't really like to split operating leverage and synergies, but just to understand um, about um, this algorithm, and um, you know, when, when we think about the the actual leverage, is there any price price that you have also taken? Because previously you said that uh, you you have been doing some price actions selectively, but not um, across the whole product range. Uh, so I was wondering if this is something that you you have been considering also when it comes to the lens portfolio um, and uh, some color on the synergies because. Clearly, uh, there must be already quite a decent amount of uh, benefits from Grand Vision coming through uh, to deliver such strong uh, profitability. So if you can give us some color on that, uh, it would be very helpful. Thank you. Morning, Susie. Um, I'll, take, uh, I'll take your question, both of them. Um, with respect to uh, the trend that we see in, uh, in uh, North America, in EMEA, um, just to give you a, a flavor of the of the evolution, especially during the month of July, uh, we do see Europe uh, continue to be very solid on both channel, um, professional solution as well as direct to consumer. Um, again, if you think about it, in Europe, the the only real country where we had a deceleration 
um, in recent months with France, and uh, and that was very much on on a specific part of the business because the reminder part remains, I would say, pretty healthy. Um, but Europe is uh, is trending well. We're solid, uh, and uh, we continue to have solid growth in both channel. Um, with respect to North America, um, North America trends are pretty similar to the one that we've seen during the course of the second quarter um, in that respect. But again, uh, my expectation for the month of, of July is to see North America on the positive territory uh, overall. Um, now, with respect to um, the growth of the second half expectations, um, as you know, we don't guide uh, on half of the year. We have a guidance that is a long-term one, a mid-single digit top-line growth. Uh, there is an expectation to hit the 19 to 20 percent uh, uh, margin on adjusted basis by 2026, and we're marching in that direction, I would say, pretty, pretty well. Um, we continue to believe on the strength of our platform in our network company, as Francesco well described before. And we believe that uh, we are very well in control of, the, of our business. Um, if you remember at the beginning of the year, I shared a flavor of what could be an expectation for, for this year with respect to a storyline of top line growth and margin expansion. And today we can confirm that. Um, with respect to the margin, um, the strong margin and operating leverage that you've seen during the first six months of the year, let me say a couple of things. Um, we drove price mix thanks to the innovation. We drove price mix thanks to the new product launches, thanks to the strength of our luxury portfolio and frames, thanks to the strength of our uh, branded lens portfolio. And that very much helped us to lift progressively the mix in the, in the upper part. We haven't really taken uh, material price adjustments uh, around our portfolio. Um, we only took a selective adjustments, whatever was needed, for uh, filling the gap of currency discrepancies. But we haven't really taken any other adjustments uh, in, in our pricing position in that respect. So the, the, the recipients and the pillars of the margin expansion that you've seen on the first half is very much uh, price mix on the gross margin lever. And on the other side, on the OPEC side, I would say a couple of things. On one side, uh, a very diligent cost control. On the other side, the realization of the synergetic work stream that we are undertaking, not only as Astro and Luxottica, but also the early stage of the work that we start doing on Grand Vision. So the combination of that allows us to keep the cost under control to ease the investment whenever we believe was the right place to do, and ultimately where we believe we have the proper return. And that is a, is a, is a mix that allows us to very much absorb the headwinds derived, deriving from the inflationary impact. Our next question comes from Graham Renwick with Berenberg. Graham, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, just firstly on price mix, you know, how, how should we think about that going forward? It's been a big driver of margin expansion in the first half, as you said. I, th I think your guidance initially was that most of your growth would be volume driven and we shouldn't expect much price mix. So do you, do you expect price mix to stabilize across H2 or, or maybe possibly reverse in a tougher macro backdrop? And is it reasonable to believe that gross margins can, again, be up or at least stable across the second half of the year? Um, and then the second one, can you sort of remind us how much of your U.S. sales base is to customers that are covered by vision insurance? And to what extent do you think that would protect the U.S. business in, in a downturn? And, and does that also explain perhaps the resilience at the higher end categories and, and the weakness at the lower end products, which I guess would have had a higher mix of uninsured customers. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, Graham. With respect to your first question on price mix, um, let me put it in this way. We, we already seen today, and I believe more so uh, going forward, 
a fairly balance between volume and, uh, and price mix on the frame side, uh, which very much goes into the reaction of your, of your question, which is uh, what we've been, uh, you know, guiding for the longer term. Uh, on the land side, we're probably more out balance on the price mix uh, in that respect. Uh, over the longer run, uh, if you remember, we said we don't have expectation to materially lift our gross margin profile, let's say, over the next uh, five years, because we, I think we have a pluses and minuses compensating each other. Um, clearly, we're pleased with what we've seen in the first half of the year. Uh, but again, over the longer run, I think we're going to see a rebalance also on the land side of our business. Uh, but today, that balance is between volume and mix is more on the frame side. Um, with respect to North America, I would say 40 to 50 percent, depending on the period, uh, is what is our insurance, let's say, coverage, uh, broadly speaking, uh, on our business. Um, it, it is a part that it's, uh, it's uh, pretty resilient despite uh, competition in the market. Uh, but I believe what has been more resilient in North America is the work that, uh, that we have done with uh, commercial programs uh, that were customized for our independent ECP. For, for example of that is the EL360 program. We have uh, over 4,300 ECPs that are now part of the EL360 program which, as you know, encompass commercial proposition for frames and lenses together, but also uh, uh, the managed vision care assets that is made available for DCP that embrace the EL360 program. That program, that activities that are done on a jointly basis, frames, lenses, insurance all together, are proving to be definitely much more resilient in the North American market. Our next question comes from Cedric LeCarbel with Stiefel. Cedric, your line is open. Yes, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. I, I have two actually on the U.S. Uh, the first one is about availability of optometrists. Uh, the, a competitor of yours, not in the same segment, uh, pointed to some difficulties to retain optometrists. Do you have any pressure uh, either on uh, volume of optometrists number of people or a sharp increase in wages in this field and, and, and what are your thoughts on this to secure the retail business in the US, number one. And number two, uh, you mentioned some trade down and some higher price competition at the lower end. What are your offset uh, strategies uh, going forward? You mentioned also more pressure on your independent ECPs, which is your your, your your good business, does it mean that the, that the chains and some value chains are gaining share currently, and how, how do you intend to react? Thank you very much. I, I can take, uh, Cedric, the second uh, point on the lower end of the market uh, in the U.S. I think the competition, there has always been competition in the mid-tier part of the market, and I think Estilor Luxotica is well positioned in the lens with offering with all of our network of labs, partner labs and independent labs. And the acquisition of Wallman is reinforcing our cost competitivity and our offer competitivity, including the Shamir lens and the Shamir design. So I think it's always been a competitive market. Uh, what Stefano pointed to where the branded lens were performing well, meaning the value, the transition, the chrysal with the new offering in chrysal is a very good aspect of our position in the U.S., including vis-à-vis -vis the vision care program. But you should consider that the, the platform that we have in place and the structure of offering we have in place for lenses is very well set up to compete in the mid-tier part of the market vis-à-vis -vis the key account, the large retailers, or um, the more uh, mid-position mid, uh, uh, independent practice. So for me, this is not a concern. The company is very well positioned in the two segments. Uh, good morning. I, I tried to answer the first question of uh, optometrists and doctors. 
uh, and more than pressure on labor costs uh, uh, and availability, I believe that uh, the issue is how engage doctorate optometrists much more in the future to be a part uh, of our mission and our uh, business. We are working uh, with two uh, main projects. One is uh, teleoptometry. Uh, we just delivered a beta test uh, in U.S. Uh, teleoptometry leads to optometrists and doctors the role, the central role that they have, but at the same time is uh, able to optimize the availability and the time of doctor. That means uh, that you have doctors in some room uh, everywhere and you can really connect to different stores and doctor rooms uh, and take uh, the visit. This is uh, supported with uh, a really strong system of information, uh, images, and, and so on. I believe that this is, will, that will be the way we can react to the pressure on availability of optometrists and also really uh, make their life a little bit better so they don't have to travel too much, they stay home or in the specific office, they can connect a better service of uh, uh, our and their customers. The second uh, is uh, vision source. You know the vision source uh, is the biggest community of optometrists and independent uh, optician in U.S. Really high hand focus on science, focus on quality on, on visit. And Silor Luxottica is leading more than owning the association. We are just starting uh, a, a really interesting problem, uh, uh, program to better involve doctors and uh, optometrists uh, and all the store managers really to share information, to share understanding of the market, and to share how to better manage uh, customers and busy. So I believe that these two combinations, to be open to a network, to be a more open company to listen to the needs uh, of optometrists and doctors, it will help to guide the market to the next level. So the combination of two me with many other initiatives that we have in place, uh, I believe it will improve the quality of our service and take the price under control. Thank you. Our next question comes from Luca Solka with Bernstein. Luca, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and good morning. Uh, maybe I will start with a general question. Uh, you have a very complex business exposed to many different fronts, uh, manufacturing, brand marketing, licenses, retail, wholesale, insurance, lenses, frames, glasses, digital, physical, high-end, low-end, and also multiple geographies, each with its own specificities. Uh, I wonder what your vision about these challenges is. Do you feel that you know, Luxottica's mission is to compete on all of these fronts and that they are more or less equally important? Or is there a hierarchy in your mind uh, so that some of these areas are going to be more relevant when it comes to dominating the category in the long term and producing a uh, uh, high return uh, for shareholders. My second question is more focused on the American market, not so much on the demand on which you already uh, explained, but about the shifting ground when it comes to competition. We've seen consolidation, especially uh, in the lower end, uh, value retail, uh, portion of the market. Uh, this is probably one of the most exposed markets to digital penetration. Uh, you have now new players in the high end as well, uh, potentially building up their position with caring eyewear buying Maui Gym. Uh, I wonder how you see uh, the competition in this market and how you are planning to confront it 
and uh, and win against it in the in the long term. Thank you very much indeed. Try to to take the first. Uh, if you if I take the your question and I change one word, uh, I believe that everybody can understand our position. You ask uh, mission to compete on all the fronts. I, I really I won't say mission to help the market in all the fronts. That is the approach uh, uh, that we have. Uh, since uh, our dimension, uh, it is difficult to find a target to compete. It's, uh, it's really difficult uh, uh, to think uh, in, in, this, uh, in this way. So what we start now is really to approach the market in the way we can improve quality of service, uh, we can improve uh, quality of product, uh, and help uh, all the market really uh, grow. With this in mind, uh, uh, the complexity that you underline on our company is really the key factor. We compete uh, in all market, all segment, all type of product. So we are the only company that I can define complete, that understand exactly 360 of the market, the needs uh, of the customer. And remember that when you are thinking about different channel, different type uh, of uh, store and country and so on, you refer always to just one single thing, customer. Customer is one, is not, is not uh, uh, we don't have different customers. Then we have uh, a different way to approach customers depend on age, capability of spending, and countries, and culture. And that is uh, what we try to do uh, through our digital platform and the capability to manage big data. Big data are really key factor behind anything right now. You know that we collect uh, all the sales every day, every day at night, we really know how much we sell, which skew we sold uh, in a certain country, how is the mood of our customer, they are preferring, yesterday they are preferring uh, round, uh, oval, red, uh, brown, and whatever. And this is really the key factor that help us to forecast the future forecast the need, not just for our store or our e-commerce, but also for wholesale. That means uh, serve more than 400,000 uh, uh, different stores uh, and, and partners. So I believe that in long term, but also we show that also in the short term, that can generate a good return for all shareholders, can protect the market, and can really also protect the people that work in, in the market. This is uh, much more than business strategy. This is the way we join the mission, the right to see, with the commitment that we took with shareholder uh, to remunerate their, their investment. So this is the way we see uh, the actual strategy and the future strategy. Thank you. Our next question Sorry, comes from the line of. Our next I, question I comes from the line of. Excuse me, operator. I just wanted to address the second question of Luca uh, on the U.S. and the shifting competition. I think you should look at the position of Estilon Luxotica in the North American market, but actually in many markets, as one of addressing the different segments of the market. I think Francesco touched on it, uh, Stefano touched on it. We have always been serving the different segments, the independent channel. We have this position that we refer to with the vision source, with all of our 
partner program, the Health 360, we have always been at the same time serving the large retailers, the NGI, the Costco, the Walmart that are acting in the market with a different proposal, different lens proposal, different frame proposal, different service proposal. And then we have, of course, this whole ecosystem around the managed care in which we, we are very well positioned, uh, serving the existing provider like VSP or uh, using our own platform like IMED. And then you have the e-commerce, which is taking a certain segment uh, that we serve with independent platform uh, like I buy direct. So the, the, the approach we have is to really be well positioned in all of the different segment channel in parallel to be present with our own retail. And I think it's a very uh, powerful and well and good position to be able to grow the market, the different categories, to bring our innovation at the different price point, our different uh, brand sunglasses, uh, uh, eye, eye, eyewear into the market. So uh, I would look at it that way, Lucas. Uh, and then the, the market is dynamic, the competition is dynamic, but this is not something that just happened. It has always been that way. Uh, and we keep reinforcing. I did mention earlier the Walmart acquisition, Walmart acquisition, which I think is a very interesting move to reinforce the mid-tier service capability of the company. Just a few uh, highlights. Back to you, operator. Thank you. Our next question comes from Julian Demois with BMP Paribas. Julian, your line is open. Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. I have two. Uh, one relates to uh, the seasonality of margin in your business. Uh, if you could just remind us uh, what are the the main drivers of uh, what is usually a much higher H1 margin uh, across your business. And I think last year, for instance, you had a, a f more than 300 basis points of difference between H1 and H2 margin. Uh, is it fair to assume that this year could be uh, about the same uh, difference um, as, we see, as we saw? Uh, and the second question is a, is a quick update on Stellest, if possible, please. Uh, I think last year, uh, in, in fiscal year 21, you had sales uh, which were just shy of 150 million euro, uh, just off of Stellest in China. Uh, you indicated that you already sold more units uh, in the first half of this year than you did in the entire year 2021. So is it fair to assume that you expect at least a doubling uh, of that business uh, for fiscal year 2022? So, uh, good morning, Julian. So, the, the first question uh, with respect to seasonality on the margin between first half and second half of the, um, as part of our business model, yes. Um, we, you, we do have uh, anywhere between 250 to 300 business points, let's say, of difference in the margin between uh, H1 and H2. The main reason for that is very much on the uh, sun season. Uh, that is stronger uh, at the later stage of Q1 and obviously at full exploitation during the second quarter, and then it progressively fade out during the remainder part of the year. Um, with respect to uh, Stellar's numbers, um, the 150 million euro sales at retail value, um, we continue to see uh, price mix holding up uh, for Stellar's in China, and clearly that number uh, will be much stronger. Hard to tell with the visibility that we have in China right now whether we're going to double uh, 2020, 2021 results. But I can tell you that as we speak really today, in this week, uh, we already passed 2021 level in terms of uh, uh, volume of uh, stellar lens uh, in China and I would say around the rest of the world. Our next question comes from Domenico Gelotti with Equita Group. Domenico, please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Two questions on my side. The first is on cost inflation. Inflation in particular, well, uh, I wonder if you are expecting the wage inflation picking up in uh, second half in 2023. And on the other hand, if you see 
cost inflation from other items, from freight rate to raw materials, uh, already say having having peaked in uh, first semester or, or say close to peak level already this year. The second question is a follow up on North America. Could you provide a bit more color because I'm not sure I, I, I catch your your uh, indication on uh, on the current uh, slowdown and uh, um, as you did for Europe, if you can give us some color on the two different uh, uh, performance in the two divisions. Buongiorno Domenico. I'll, I'll, I'll take both the, the answer to your two questions. First of all, on cost inflation. Um, when we look at our, our, our cost inflation, um, you know, the primary driver of that, as you rightly pointed out, is, uh, is the wage inflation. Uh, it's, it's the biggest part of that uh, headwind that we're feeling. Uh, I think it has been probably stronger in the second quarter, uh, more than in the first quarter, and I believe will carry on uh, uh, throughout the uh, third quarter, and then we'll see how it's going to evolve throughout the, the latter part of 2022. Um, hard to predict what we can expect in 2023. But again, the, the, the work that we've been doing, uh, it's, it's very much in the direction of protecting and offsetting those uh, inflationary trends. Um, being the largest one, labor is not the only one. Uh, we're also exposed to uh, freight costs as you rightly pointed out, and obviously the energy cost. Uh, probably the least of the exposure that we have from a profit and loss standpoint is material. A lot of our business model is being vertically integrated, uh, very much reduced the exposure to material, and I think we found a lot of uh, uh, measures that allow us to offset uh, on the material side. So labor, uh, freight, logistic costs, and the energy costs are really the key the three most important drivers, with labor being by far the largest one. Uh, with respect to North America, I, I, again, I want to point out that we are aligned on this. Uh, we do expect North America July business to be on the positive territory, and that is, uh, is, uh, is true for our uh, direct-to-consumer part of the business as well as our professional solution. So that's, uh, that's the picture. That was our last question of our 30 minutes Q&A session. I will now turn the call back to the management team to conclude. Hey, thanks uh, for staying with us uh, and uh, we hope to have some rest uh, at least a couple of weeks uh, and so see you after the summer break. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This concludes our call and you may now disconnect your lines.